and miss my plane. And I called Dennis Moynihan, co-author of this book. I said, you got to get me on the next plane. He brings up the blueprints of the airport. He's a fantastic researcher. I said, not the blueprints. I just need a ticket. And he said, are you in the Frederick Douglass wing or the Susan B. Anthony wing of the airport, I said. And I look, and there it says Frederick Douglass. There it says Susan B. Anthony. Every once in a while, you have to stop and smell the coffee. But these movements, take them through to today. Think about Rosa Parks, that remarkable woman who sat down in the bus December 1st, 1955 and launched the modern day civil rights movement. The media even got her story wrong. When she died here in Washington, she was the first African American woman to lay in state in the Capitol Rotunda. And then her body was brought to a Washington church. Some of you might have been there. Thousands were. Oprah was inside. Cicely Tyson was inside. Outside, hundreds of people with big speakers so you could hear what was going on outside. I asked a young woman who was in the audience outside, what are you doing here? She said, I emailed my professors. I said, I won't be in class today. I'm going to get an education. Now, everyone knows this story. Rosa Parks sits down in the bus and in so doing stands up for all of us fighting segregation in Montgomery, Alabama. But when the media told the story, they said, Rosa Parks was a tired seamstress. She was no troublemaker. That's where they got it wrong. Rosa Parks was a first-class troublemaker. She knew exactly what she was doing on December 1st, 1955. She was, I'm talking very loud, she was the secretary of the local NAACP. She worked with Edie Nixon. He came out of radical labor politics, president of the local NAACP, he organized the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters with A. Philip Randolph. He helped organize the 1963 March on Washington. They knew exactly what they're doing. She trained at the Highlander Center. King was there also to most effectively strategize to change the racist laws of this country. The media denigrates activists. But what can be more noble than dedicating your life to making the world a better place? And to show how brave Rosa was, go back a few months to the summer of 1955, the summer of Emmett Till. 14-year-old African-American boy in Chicago, his mother, Mamie Till, wants him out of the city for the summer, sends him to his aunt and uncle in Money, Mississippi. He's asleep with his cousins and his aunt and uncle in the house. He's ripped out of bed by a white mom. They said he wolf whistled at a white woman and he ends up in the bottom of the Tallahatchie River. When his body was dredged up and sent back to Chicago, his mother, Mamie Till, was incredibly courageous. She said she wanted the casket open for the wake and the funeral. She wanted the world to see the ravages of racism, the brutality of bigotry. Thousands passed by his casket and saw and then Jet Magazine and other black publications took photographs of his distended, mutilated head, and they were seared into the history and consciousness of this country. Mamie Till had something very important to teach the press of today. Show the pictures. Show the images. Could you imagine if for just one week we saw the images of war everywhere in this country, above the fold of every surviving newspaper, a photograph and a story of a soldier dead and dying? Every top of every radio and TV newscast, a picture of a baby dead on the ground. Every Facebook wall, every tweet, every email talked about a woman with her legs blown off by cluster bombs or a family killed in a drone attack. Americans are a compassionate people. They would say, no, war is not the answer to conflict in the 21st century. And I will end with just this thought. Back in the Egyptian Revolution, right before Mubarak fell, there was a young man named Kareem Amr, who was a blogger who'd been imprisoned for four years under Mubarak for blogging against the state. When he got out, he was in Tahrir, and then he disappeared. No one knew where he was. And Dennis and I were doing our column that week. We write about it in the Silence Majority, and I look forward to signing copies afterwards. Um, I hope that you will come over, uh, and whether you get books or not, think about holidays, graduations. What we want to do is drive books up that include voices of people all over the world to challenge the traditional New York Times bestseller list, to make a difference, to give hope 
to people for writing their own accounts of what's happening, to let these publishers know that there is a whole different market, we actually call it civilization, that is deeply interested in voices of peace. But I will end with this story, with Kareem Amr, disappeared, no one knows where he is, Dennis and I are writing our column that week. I am texting Sharif, where is Kareem, where is Kareem? And Dennis goes to Kareem's blog. And it's dedicated to Hans and Sophie Scholl. You know who they were, a young brother and sister in Nazi Germany. Um, and together with their professor and other students and some workers, they formed the White Rose Collective. The White Rose Collective, the White Rose Society, they thought, what can we do in the face of the Nazi atrocity? They weren't Jewish, they were German Christians. They thought at least we could get out information so the Germans will never be able to know, we will never be able to say we didn't know. So they distributed six pamphlets. On the fourth pamphlet were written the words, we will not be silent. They distributed them everywhere, in alleyways, in marketplaces, in schoolyards, in the middle of night. And then they were captured, Hans and Sophie, with their professor. They were charged by the Nazis, they were tried, they were convicted, and they were beheaded. But that philosophy, that motto, should be the Hippocratic Oath of the media today, should be the Hippocratic Oath of us all today. We will not be silent. Democracy now.